Jay Baba. This is the fourth session uh, in our series on Francis Brabazon's Stay With God, his epic poem. The formal title of the complete 16 session series is Stay With God, Francis Brabazon's epic masterpiece as a proclamation of Meher Baba's avatarhood and foundation laying for the new world civilization. Uh, this slide shows you the uh, sequence of sessions. It might be a little bit hard to read from this PowerPoint, but I'm just scrolling through to uh, show you the 16 sessions. Each of them is described in brief. Um, this and other materials can be found on the internet, uh, both under the comments in, the U in all of the various YouTube um, session videos and on Facebook also. There are links there, you can click on them, you could get this and download it as a PDF. Uh, for the, if you want to see where we're going and get some idea of what the topics are. Here's another item to be found there. This is an expanded version of that same thing. Um, session three, which was the last video, uh, began to look at book one of Francis Brabazon's Stay With God. Stay With God is divided into five, what he calls, books. And the first book is a, a biography of Meher Baba from his birth until 1955, which is when Baba gave Francis the order to write Stay with God. So last time, uh, we're going to devote four sessions, sessions three, four, five, and six, to the first book. And the last time, we started to look a bit um, at uh, especially the opening, as you can see there, the number two under session three, Roman numeral two, the proem and the avataric theme. Um, the next bit, uh, right after that, Baba's childhood contact with his masters, etc. We're going to resume from there. We may not follow this rigidly, video by video. That is to say, there's some slack in section six, and we may expand and spill over into that. In this version of the uh, syllabus, which you can download, read on as a PDF online or download, as you can see, there are focal readings. So these are readings recommended for viewers um, who would like to uh, have pre-read what I'm going to be talking about. For example, in uh, uh, session three, um, it was Stay With God from book one, pages 20 to 23. And uh, this time we're going to begin, actually recapitulate a little bit of, from that previous session, but go on to uh, uh, the early gathering and training of the disciples with significant thematic and narrative digressions. Then Francis, which is pages 23 to 30 in Stay With God. Then Francis's brief account of the Maribad ashram. Then the first visits to the West with a thematic digression on the subject of poverty. And then Francis, uh, Baba's uh, work with the musts with significant Odyssean digression, that's from Homer's The Odyssey, and stories from the Wayfarer. So that will be the general topic uh, that we'll be um, covering today. And I would just like to also draw your attention to this further item to be found in the uh, supplementary materials that you can download. This is a daily study guide, as you can see, and um, it's organized the same way, session by session. So for um, session three, for example, uh, let me get to it. Okay, here we have session four, as you can see. And uh, this gives you a fairly developed account uh, of some of the subject or matter we'll be reviewing and a series of study questions, that is, topics to be thinking about in relation to the content of this video. I'm gonna, I just want to call your attention to all this material 
for people who want to uh, dig in more deeply, in that syllabus that I showed you a second ago, there are also, there's readings uh, relevant to session four, Stay With God, pages 23 to 43. Then, uh, also, as one of the materials uh, online that you can download, there's uh, uh, pages from The Odyssey, Homer's The Odyssey, and pages from William Donkin's The Wayfarers. For anyone who wants to go in greater depth into readings <clears throat> that would be relevant to the topic we're covering today. Okay. Then to uh, resume, with uh, uh, book one of Stay With God. Are you getting it? Okay, because I changed the slide. Uh, last time, we opened with the uh, proem, P-R-O-E-M, which is the name for the opening segment of an epic. I read last time from Homer's Prom to Homer's Odyssey, which and from Francis was drawing on Homer all the way through. So I'm going to resume a little bit. This opening section, as you can see here, has seven stanzas. And when I say section, right, you see that little line splitting up? So these are formal divisions in Book 1, which Francis has put in. Book 1 is divided into seven sections. And the first section that we're looking at has seven stanzas. And you see what a stanza is? It's, there's a break after seven lines. And each stanza has seven lines in it. So I've talked in previous sessions about the formal organization of Stay With God. This is quite intentional. Uh, so last time we looked at his invocation. This is a standard epic device where Homer, for example, will invoke the muses, the gods, the goddesses of poetry. Francis is doing the same thing, but his muse is Baba. So he says, sing Baba, your descent this time on earth, your brightness in our night, your comfort in our separation. So going on from there, I said a little bit about it last time, but I want to reemphasize in the second stanza, Francis is expressing, as he does in the dedicatory and in the stanza at the end of Stay With God, which we've also looked at, um, the theme of my, the poet's, inadequacy and how only if you uh, inspire me and give me the words to say and give me the inspiration can this work of telling this story be completed. As I say, Homer does this time and again, Virgil does it. This is standard in epic. I think it's quite sincere in Francis's part. Um, so here he says, exp ex develops on this topic. For it is my love's desiring, Baba, to compose a book on this theme which you set me. And to this task, my spirit spreads its wings only to fall stifled and overcome the song groaning in my breast, impossible in utter utterance, right? Because Baba, Baba, you told me to write this, but my spirit spreads its wings. Notice the first word of Stay With God is wings towards the glaciers of Kailas, right? We're going to soar to this, uh, the summits of God, and my spirit spreads its wings, but I then I just fall, it's hopeless. I can't do it. I can't give expression to it. Why? This is why. For only a perfect master can speak a book. Notice the metaphor, speak a book. Only a perfect master can do a job like this. And saintship is the least qualification to sing of you. You have to be a saint to do, even be a beginner in this game. Although a profound scholarship is sufficient for assembling of mere facts. You know, it's possible to write a scholarly book about this. But I have neither devotion nor learning for the task. Okay. And now he's going to cite precedents, and these are going to be important in Stay With God. In the past, you had Vyasa and Homer and Valmiki and many others who were your name and yourself to leave your name, and this is a beautiful phrase, in impassioned prisonment of words. That's like 
a way of describing what the Ramayana is. Now these uh, names he gives, Vyasa is the putative author of the Mahabharata and many other things. The Mahabharata is one of the two great epics of India in which you find, among many other things, the life story of Krishna. And Valmiki is the, uh, the author, the, the attributed author of the Ramayana, uh, which is the great epic, um, uh, Sanskrit um, epic account of the life of Ram. Okay, so these are, Francis is giving these as precedents, and these were the authors of it. And Homer, of course, is the Greek, ancient Greek author of the Iliad and the Odyssey, and Francis has the highest opinion of Homer, seems even to think of him as a perfect master. So, Francis is situating what he is undertaking in this context. In Western literature, epic is widely regarded as the uh, highest and greatest of the literary genres. So it's like he's taking on an impossible task. I read uh, last time the opening passage for Milton, who wrote a great epic, Paradise Lost, and he says this too. Um, to soar to heights never reached before, which can only be accomplished with the aid of the heavenly muse. Um, so then Francis uh, goes on, only if you, Baba, sustain my flight, give knowledge to my intellect. You see the difference? You have the divine knowledge has to come to the assistance of the pitiable, poor intellect of mere Francis. Um, a knowledge to my intellect and unbind the empathy of my heart. Isn't that beautiful? And it's not just intellect, my heart has to swell to such an extent that I can actually feel what I'm talking about and give proper, only then can this work be done, not miracle, but faith. And faith, uh, faith is grace. Faith that is grace, and grace your miracle. So here he's expressing the theme and begging Baba, basically, to be allowed, to be inspired by God, by you, Baba, as my muse, uh, to undertake this task. He's really put, this is the high style. In other words, he's, he takes a lot of chutzpah, it takes a lot of self-confidence to undertake anything like this at all. And he's not hiding it. Okay, now the next few stanzas, he moves into new relevant topics. And here's one of them. He says, ignorant men, men of domestic culture, say that Jesus was the first bringer of love. Okay, now you see he's declaring Baba to be the avatar and has listed Zoroaster, Abraham, Ram, Krishna, Buddha, Jesus, Muhammad. So now he's dealing with the fact that this religious tradition, Christianity, would reject the possibility of this because the Son of God came for the first and only time as Jesus. And Francis is not sparing in his criticism of this view. Ignorant men, men of domestic culture. Despicable is their doctrine. <coughs> Having it that before this, God was loveless. What a despicable doctrine to say that God came the first time as Jesus, and before that he didn't care about humanity. Okay, one thing Francis is doing is he's declaring he is not going to spare in his criticism of the false views uh, of civilization past and present. And Christianity is the target of his attacks a, a lot. Um, uh, and other ignorant men have it that love is now sealed that there is no further need of his descent and example. Okay, he's referring here to Muslims because uh, one of the hadith of sayings of Muhammad is that, or maybe it's in the Quran, I'm not sure, I think it might be a hadith, but maybe it's in the Quran, is that Muhammad is the seal of the prophets. Uh, and that is taken by Muslims to mean he's the last one, he's it. Uh, and Francis, later on, a few lines, says, each avatar is the seal on everything that came before. Seal doesn't mean the last. It means this present one is a seal on what came before. So here is taking on this really fundamental Islamic doctrine. Uh, there is no further need of his descent and example. 
Love does not admit of a first or last. God is never of more nor less. All his bright messengers were nothing but love and the essence of love, sun bright and holy perfect. Another big theme in the state of God. He's going to keep recurring to these various avatars and perfect masters too and holding them up as exemplifications of God's love as the avatar to humanity. Uh, throughout the entire book, this is going to go on happening. Now he's, the next stanza, he's going to give a review of a bunch of people who he seems to regard as avatars, and the one after that of various deities and perfect masters. Thus, Moses was this, that is, the essence of love, sun bright and holy perfect. For he said, love God with your whole heart and soul. Sakyamuni, that's one of the names of Buddha. Sakyamuni was this, for he showed man the way of release and bliss. And the 24 Buddhas before him, for they were all releasers. In Buddhist tradition, the Buddha is said to be the 24th Buddha. Okay, Zarathustra was the same flame because he told men, when you behold the sunrise, or by your heart fire, remember the light in your hearts. Okay, in all of these cases, Francis is bringing up thoughts and images very characteristic of these avataric incarnations. In Zoroaster's case, Zarathustra's case, the God is uh, regarded, associated with the sun and with fire. And the Zoroastrian Agyari, um, the fire temple, they always keep a fire burning. Ram was this because his arrows were a rain of love. Okay, he's referring here to the life of Ram where he was a warrior and his weapon was the arrow. It's going to come up a lot in the state of God. In fact, Francis is going to associate Ram with Achilles, the leading character in the Iliad whose weapon was the spear and he links them poetically. Um, Abraham, so Francis is taking Abraham to be an our avatar too was this, because he told men to destroy their idols. Actually, Muhammad did the same thing. So notice that Francis is mentioning very different thoughts. Adherence to these religions would say these views are completely different. But Francis is saying they are all in their essence the same thing of love for God. In other words, he's declaring open war on the narrowness and sectarianism of people who would deny that the avatar can come time and again. He's going to be quite a, a warrior in this book. So when he's declaring Baba to be the avatar, or um, upholding Meher Baba's declaration to be the avatar, Francis is going to go right ahead and assert this and celebrate it and explain how it is true. See, uh, In the next um, stanza, we're still in this opening section, Francis says, now notice he's going to move now enough from avatars to other divine personalities of one sort or another. And of love was Pallas Athena. Athena. Now, Pallas Athena is one of the goddesses uh, in Greek mythology, and she is the special patron of Odysseus. She follows Odysseus in his wanderings throughout and helps him and makes it possible for him to survive. And uh, Odysseus's son was Telemachus. You see, in the second line, in Telemachus's heart, and at the very opening of the Iliad, she stirs up Telemachus to go and do this adventurous thing. And uh, so Francis is uh, interpreting as this as she is inspiring him on the heroic path, which is the path to God. The heroic theme is there. And of love was Apollo, another uh, Greek god. Um, um, and now in the second half of the stanza, uh, he starts to come to some perfect masters. And of love was Chaitanya, uh, for he repeated one word, Krishna. See, Francis is, you, <laughs> the new edition of Stay With God is going to have a glossary where all these guys are identified. Uh, but Francis just takes it for granted that you're going to figure out how they are. He has notes of his own as he explains some of it. Chaitanya, is it Mahaprabhu? I think he's called that. Um, was one of the greatest saints of the bhakti tradition in India. He lived in like uh, uh, Orissa, Bengal, 
and he was a great devotee of uh, Lord Krishna and helped to inspire the worship and adoration, the love of Krishna uh, in North India. Francis had the highest opinion of him. He sure looks like a perfect master. If he wasn't, I don't know who was, uh, for he repeated one word, Krishna, and was Shankara, Shankaracharya, this too, for he said many words explaining that all men were God. Okay, Shankaracharya is great Adi Shankaracharya, lived seven, eight hundred, something like that, who was the, uh, uh, maybe, in my opinion, the greatest philosopher of all times, I taken as such, who was a God-realized and the founding figure in, in Advaita Vedanta. So these are very great and celebrated spiritual figures in their particular traditions. Of course, if you don't know about Indian spirituality, you won't know. So his notes and the new glossary could help you out. Um, so, uh, and in the last stanza, he comes to Krishna and he says, it is better and says, if I were to pick one emblem among all of them, I would take Krishna as my favorite. But then he says, it is better to reverence all his names and say Baba, who is the love now and the glory and the awakening and the fresh half setting. So I, we honor all of them, but Baba is the new one who has come now. This ends his opening declaration. It's quite a magnificent uh, piece of work, in my opinion. Okay, now we come into the second section, and I'll be skipping more. Uh, we could spend 100, 101 sessions on Stay With God easily and go over every part of it, and it would repay the effort, but we don't have, won't take that time here. Now he starts in on Baba's childhood. So this time, God took birth at 5 a.m. on February 25th, 1894. And um, he, in much of book one, will relate um, some of Baba's external biography. I won't be going into that so much because uh, uh, you can read Baba's bio biography in many other places. Um, I mean, his account of it is very worth reading for its poetical feeling that he puts into it. Uh, but when he wrote this, biographies of Meher Baba were hard to come by. This is 1959. There were just a few. Now they're quite bountiful. Um, but in the course of this biographical section, this whole book, Francis um, works and weaves in um, various, I'll call them digressions of different sorts. I mentioned this last time but I want to reiterate, uh, of various types. Sometimes he'll focus in on a certain moment uh, in Baba's life and expand on it. Uh, so there is a, a distinction in narratologists, people who study narrative, between what they call scene and summary as techniques of narration. Summary is when you relate an account um, in an abbreviated way, but when you do it scenically, you actually create a scene with characters in it. So most, of, a lot of this narration is summary, but in certain places, Francis will expand it to a scenic uh, narration of his story. That's one kind of, I'm calling it a digression, but it's actually an expansion from summary to scene. Um, another a kind of digression that he will go into will be a narrative digression where he will divert or digress from Baba's life uh, to an account um, uh, of uh, various other masters. Like in book one, we have an extended digression on Naropa and Tilapa, two great masters who lived in North India, uh, uh, Buddhist masters. And then he goes into a digression on Jalaluddin Rumi and Shamsi Tabriz. Um, the, Rumi is very famous now as the most popular best-selling poet in America. <laughs> a, a poetic genius and his spiritual master was Shamsi Tabriz. So Francis goes into these digressions to make a certain point that we'll be coming to soon. That's another thing that he does. But there's a third kind of digression also, and that's a thematic digression. 
I mentioned some of these last time, but we're going to go into the more where uh, one of the first he'll come to will be uh, the two sides of a master, the fiery and the gentle. He doesn't use these words, but he means the Jalali and the Jamali, uh, the sun and the moon, he uses as symbols for this. So he digresses on this for a number of stanzas, and it turns out to be a huge theme in State of God. So we're going to see a bunch of these thematic, on poverty is another one. As soon, okay, I'll come to it presently. Uh, uh, but when you see these digressions, um, know that Francis is introducing major themes that he's going to be developing on throughout the entire poem. He keeps coming back to them. Uh, so this first, this uh, second section of 14 stanzas carries the story, as I say, from Baba's birth up until the end of his close association with Upasni Maharaj. So the section after that will begin with his actual avataric mission. But I just want to call your attention to this digression. Or it's not a digression, it's, well, it's sort of a digression. It's not really, but page 21, where he brings up about Hazrat Babajan um, giving Baba the kiss by which he was God realized. Okay? Um, now he goes on an ex explanation of what the perfect masters are. Uh, many people, of course, won't know this even today, but remember that back in those days, nobody would have known what a perfect master is. So the office of the perfect five is permanent. Before one dies, he raises another person to perfect mastership to take his place, etc. So he's explaining how they govern the universe for the next stanza. They choose his parents, attend to every detail of his birth, Throughout his childhood, they watch him tenderly, etc. Uh, Francis is going to come back to this again a number of times, but uh, particularly in uh, Book 5. And he says how Babajan gave him the inconceptual experience of his own reality. So he's talking about Baba's God realization, where he experienced the reality of God, uh, which is beyond imagination and conception. Um, the five brought him down, wrapped in the veil of humanity. Uh, Babajan, with a kiss, unwrapped him to who he was. Upasni gave him the knowledge of what he was to do, brought him down through the seven planes, etc. So he's talking about what the different perfect masters that Baba was associated with, those two especially, but there were five, uh, the role they played. Now here's another one of these great poetic passages. It somehow is very memorable. About the time. He's going to talk about the avatar manifests according to the time and place in which he takes birth. The time was again God's avatar. And now he's quoting from Rumi here. You see the quotation marks. You'll see the reference in Francis's notes. The time was Jesus. The message was the same as Moses. Jesus was the soul of Moses, and Moses was the soul of Jesus, but it was Jesus' turn. Okay, he's quoting from Jalaluddin Rumi. The time was Sakyamuni Buddha. The message was Adi Buddhas, 24 previously. Adi means first, so the first Buddha of 24. Does the Blessed One expound a doctrine which is new and original? This is... Uh, Buddha's disciple Sariputta. Um, no, this is Buddha asking, and now Sariputta answers. If the Blessed One expounded a doctrine which is new and original, he would not be the Blessed One. Well said, Sariputta. Well said. <laughs> so Francis is quoting a little bit of dialogue between Buddha and one of his leading disciples, making the point, the message is the same. It seems different, but that is just because of time and place, right? So Francis is making these emphatic arguments. He continues, the time was Krishna, the time was Rama, the time was Zarathustra, the time, the time. The world is wrapped in time, and place is men's gar uh, garment. When it was the time for God to demonstrate the poverty of riches, 
he was called Solomon and preached life's vanity. Solomon was one of the prophets in the uh, uh, Old Testament, or the, uh, the, not the Torah, I think it would be the Torah, um, the Tanakh, they certainly call it in the Jewish uh, Hebrew Bible. Um, and he was tremendously wealthy. And yet, one of the uh, books of the Bible attributed to him is Ecclesiastes, which says, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Everything is vain, everything is worthless. So amid all this splendorous wealth, Solomon was teaching all this is nothing, you see? So Francis is quoting him in this way. The word vanity would be known to the readers of the English Bible, especially the St. James Version, which Francis would have known. When it was time to practice democracy, he was called Muhammad. You see, Francis is going to associate Muhammad with democracy because he was a man among men with warriors and set all these laws for an ordered society where people would all live together rather than, say, the much more hierarchical caste system which you find in the Ramayana, for example. So Francis is kind of saying, well, okay, I'll gloss. Democracy is ostensibly quite different from the caste system which Rama upheld. But the fundamental message underneath it all is the same, and he gives the same message in different forms as is suited to the time and place where he comes. That's what Francis is, is arguing. Uh, who lived among men equally in their joys and words, etc. The time is now Baba, who is the same one as the first one, the ancient one. Only the squint-eyed see two ones. But the last one supersedes the one before, else it were idle to come again. He's explaining, why does the avatar keep coming? You supersede to adjust to the circumstances. His first coming would have been sufficient to the end of time. And God would not have had the great pleasure of renewal with his lovers, or of meeting his future devotees. Imagine anyone taking the trouble of making the world and, and visiting it only once. So Francis is making the case, of course there are many avatars. He's doing this because in many of the religions they would most emphatically reject this idea. Hinduism would accept it. Buddhism would in its own way, but many religions would not. The last one is the same as the first, but the last one is the seal of the message giving it the imprint of his last present form. So what Francis is doing here, he's taking this Islamic doctrine that Muhammad is the seal of the prophets. This has been understood by Muslims to mean Muhammad is the last, he's the end of it. But Francis is using the metaphor in a different way. Um, but the last one is the seal of the message giving it the imprint of his last present form. Um, in other words, each avatar is a seal. It's a new seal. The seal of the prophets doesn't mean that there aren't any more. See, so Francis is actually taking on this um, Islamic doctrine. And then towards the end of it, he goes on to this and he says, read God Speaks. Okay, here his first reference to God Speaks, uh, which he's going to refer to again and again. As I said in an earlier session, Baba said that uh, stay with God is second only to God speaks and it gives life to God speaks. So Francis is, of course Francis didn't know when he wrote this that Baba would praise it to such an extent, uh, but Francis keeps referring to it. Also, Francis almost certainly got his copy of God Speaks uh, at the 1955 November Sahabas. That's That month is when the book came out and uh, when Baba gave him the order to write Stay with God. See, so here's another connection. He's connecting, the poem is getting connected with God Speaks, another important theme. Um, now here's, he's going to introduce another theme that I've never heard expressed quite this way, but this delightful and frequent recurrence of God's pleasure in knowing himself, this well-pleasedness with himself, this perfect vanity of his. Now have you ever, you know what vanity is? It's sort of like, let's say 
women who are very, very pretty can be very vain of their pretty. They're pretty and they know it and they like it when men admire them, right? Um, so he's attributing vanity to uh, Baba and to the avatar. Have you thought of that before? But Baba does exhibit that quality. Baba would say, how do I look? You know, like that. And, oh, Baba, you look so beautiful. And then he's so pleased. Isn't that like the vanity of a selfish person? But Francis is making the point, the vanity of the Divine Beloved is actually part of his, uh, his, uh, um, his mastery. Because he is a, aren't they beautiful? He wants you to say, oh, Baba, you're so beautiful. I love you so much. Because he wants to awaken love in the lover. His vanity has that purpose. So you see, Francis is making a point about the avatar that one might not have thought of. Perfect vanity um, is the amazement of his lovers and is the cause of their tears of joy in impossible sighs. So Baba is so beautiful and he doesn't give a damn about you. You know, he's cruel. Oh, go away. You know, uh, you know, Baba will reject someone. He's, Baba, you're so beautiful. I love you so much. Why do you care about me? That is to awaken in me the agony of love because that is the path to God. You see, so Francis is very beautifully introducing one of the aspects of uh, the, the Master and the Divine Beloved. Okay. Um, and then it ends with Merwan took leave of Opasni and returned to Pune, where a hut had been built for him in the outskirts of the city. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to continue this um, session just a little bit more running into the beginning of Baba's work with the, his disciples, which, as you can see here, uh, starts at the beginning of the third subdivision of Book One. This subdivision is very long. It's 101 stanzas. I had mentioned in a previous video the numbers are significant. Um, the first section had seven, the second 14. Now it's 101. Notice there are 101 names of God in Zoroastrianism. There are a lot of numeric patterns uh, going. And this um, section is going to extend from the beginning of Baba's avataric work, which I would date to right around February, end of January, February 1922, up until the end of the old life, uh, which um, runs us through July, June, July 1949. So this is a very long section, and I'm going to talk now just about the very start of it. He begins to uh, relate stories uh, of Baba's uh, first gathering of his disciples. After leaving uh, Upasni Maharaj, Baba was in Bombay a good bit and began to attract young men towards himself. So that's what this is about. Now he began to gather his disciples. It was one of these who first called him Meher Baba, or Compassionate Father. And then he tells how various ones were drawn. Some he drew directly, using the patience of a master lover, flattering their whims, widening gradually the space in their hearts, etc. Okay, one who had been his schoolfellow and was unaware that the universes and the wonders of the six planes lay at his feet, Baba great greeted in well-meeting, left the veil across his eyes, and resumed the friendship at its former level. So Baba's getting a little more into depth, and this would be, although Francis doesn't mention it, Dr. Abdul Ghani. Um, and then he spends two cents, uh, stanzas talking about how Baba drew Ghani to him. If it's worth a consummation, it's worth a wooing. Well, what is that about? Uh, this is using the marital image. If it's worth eventually achieving union in love with this disciple, it's worth wooing him. In other words, Baba would woo. You know what wooing is? A man woos a woman. He wants to be his wife. Baba is wooing his disciples. And so Francis is reviewing some of this. And the uh, next Page, he starts um, um, t 
telling, uh, I'll skip the digression in the first stanza, but see the second stanza, love's claiming of another lover also followed an excursive route, uh, of course. And in this case, he's going to tell the story of, uh, Ab Abdul, uh, of Ramju Abdullah um, and how he was drawn to Baba. He was a Muslim and how these things started to happen. Um, and uh, finally, Baba, he said, uh, Baba said, ask anything you like of me, long life, wealth, fame, and I will see that you get it. But, but the better thing would be to make you, make up your mind to do whatever I tell you to do. My mind was weighed up, made up. I have followed this man now for 30 years and obeyed him. So here he's giving us the personal narratives of uh, some of his close men disciples. The next stanza appears to be relating um, more briefly some of the story of Adi Kehrani and then possibly Erich. So I think I'll wrap up this video uh, here. So this we'll call this uh, session 4A. And the next video we're going to start um, from here, continuing with Baba's work at Mirabad. Okay, Jay Baba.